Mark Romero, that was probably among the most effective parts of the prosecution's presentation, wasn't it? Well, it really is for a number of reasons. Don't forget, we as people, and certainly jurors, we learn by seeing. You know, by hearing is okay, but you know, you listen to it, you might get most of it. But when you see it and you really understand it, that's what you remember constantly. And that's what the jury remembers both when they were seeing it and when they went back to the jury room to talk about it. So I love and, and I like using demonstrative tools in a courtroom because we learn by seeing, and I thought that was very, very effective. And then his testimony after it supports the visualization. How effective did you guys think that was? So it's important because remember what was happening here. What was happening, that was a defense, that was an expert, by the way, from the prosecution who was doing that. It's demonstrative, right? And it what, came after a defense crime scene expert. Exactly. And so remember what they were talking about, which was that it was a five foot two. It would have to be someone who was a lot shorter. And remember, the prosecutor was mocking that, talking right. the about defense, a 12 The defense expert old. said there, there's no way a six foot four person, Paul, which is Alec Murdoch, would have been able to fire from that angle the gun that was used. Correct. They would have had to have it. It would be overly low. It would be just unsustainable and it couldn't happen. And so at issue was whether or not, of course, the defense was trying to exclude the notion that a person of the height of Alex Murdoch would have committed this crime. And then, of course, this was the comeback. And the comeback of the prosecution was nonsense. And essentially, that expert pretty much said it's preposterous. What they're suggesting, they being the defense, that it would be this five for two person, too many variables. So I thought that absolutely was effective at demonstrating to the jury that the notion that the, that the defense had with respect to the height of the shooter was just nonsensical. I agree. I think that was a moment where the defense just lost a lot of credibility because their forensic theory of why it would have been a, a shooter of a different height or two shooters really sort of went down the drain at that point. I mean, the, you heard the witness say it was a preposterous theory, and they showed how it was preposterous by reenacting it, and it involved the shooter sort of pushing past Paul as the victim into this narrow doorway to go be behind him and then shoot him from inside this narrow space, which really made no sense. Um, and he, he just explained then, after the demonstration, in words why it was preposterous. So I thought that was a really important moment. John, you were saying during the break about the, the expectations that we've all, you know, we watch CSI, we we see uh, you know a crime in a big city and how many cameras there are. Talk about that a little bit. I mean, I think jurors, um, even in a place uh, like North Carolina where they are watching you know these stories, are used to these seamless cases where you know you have the video canvas that's done after the fact and you see the defendant leaving his house and you see him getting into the car and then they present the license plate reader evidence that tracks the car everywhere along the way. Then you see the video of them getting out. Then you see the cell phone tracking. And these cases really can be seamless um, in an environment of a 1,700-acre farm that doesn't have security cameras everywhere where the, where the cell phone evidence was presented, but it was confusing and spotty. You've got a really circumstantial case. And I think that the defense struggled. I mean, that last scene we just looked at, where they're taking apart the defense's kind of tortured theory by demonstrating it looks almost impossible if you try to reenact it that way, is on top of the idea that both guns came from the property. Why would the killers not bring their own guns? Why would the killers have the ability to know that the mom and the son would be at that spot at that time? How would they know that? If the idea was that the killers showed up because they knew they could access weapons uh, from the property um, because those weapons wouldn't be traced to them. Why were the weapons missing after the fact? If you didn't want them traced to you, why would you take them? There was just so much in terms of the pile on on things that one fact might have been an explanation to fill a gap, but together they couldn't harmonize them to make sense. Including shell casings. That from were those the weapons Correct. that were found on the property, not from this shooting, from prior shots that seemed to match. Jill yeah. Hundley, uh, as a jury consultant, I mean, what's so fascinating is that there were two weapons. The defense was saying, well, that's, you know, that's evidence of two shooters. It, what it may be evidence of, uh, if the jury is correct, and, and, I mean, Alec Murdoch is now, has been convicted of killing his, his wife and son, is that this was thought out and perhaps intentional that he Stage. was using, it was staged, that he, uh, he was intentionally using. two shooters. Right. And, and it does seem, um, Jill, I just want to ask you, though, 
as a jury consultant, how do demonstrations like that, I mean, it, in, in your experience, are they particularly effective for on jurors? Oh, absolutely. I completely agree. The jurors need visuals and to act something out, especially with a witness like this, who was a very credible witness who definitely connected and made common sense, um, made a common sense presentation to the jury. And then the jury goes to Moselle. And even though the defense asked for that, the jury now can specifically visualize uh, where this took place. So thought that was an interesting strategy. The, the premeditation, John, of this now is so fascinating. To, now, that, now that we have this conviction, you look back at all the steps that Alec Murdoch took, calling his friends to say, oh, I've, I've invited, you know, the, I'm going down to, uh, to see, you know, my family, um, to s call up his friends. And he tried to call one friend to tell him he was going to go visit his mom. He called other people to try to basically lay out alibis all along the way. Uh, very much like we just discussed with the two guns. You know, well, let me make it look like it appear it's two people. And yet, you know, look at those two elements that his own son, the murder victim, may have inadvertently solved the case with that piece of video. And, and his wife, who, you know, they were in the throes of having a very difficult time. The son had found the pills in the computer bag and, you know, his $60,000 a week, uh, you know, oxy habit. Um, the wife was saying, you know, this was a betrayal. There were financial people closing in on these other frauds where, you know, if she went south from him, that was going to be a problem. And, and I mean, she texts, she messages somebody as she's going to the farm. You know, it was, well, we'll all drive separately. No, let's drive together. You come here. Mm. He's setting this up. And she, she messages somebody and says, I'm going to the farm to meet him there. It seems fishy. She misses her sister, right. who actually testifies, uh, and her sister feels incredibly guilty on the stand, saying she actually encouraged her sister to go that night to see her husband. But, I mean, you can see the elements yeah. of him building a storyline ahead of time, setting up the movement. And even going to visit his mother, establishing an alibi, a mother who, you know, has Alzheimer's and is not going to be testifying against him. There was a nurse present who did, did testify. Yeah, I, I think the defendant in some ways made himself uh, more vulnerable to this, uh, this, the prosecution theory that he was staging an alibi when from the beginning, when he's interviewed by the investigators of the night of the murders, he says, check my phone, check my phone. That'll tell you the times of things. And so he was urging them to go look he for the digital trail. <laughs> he had, it, it just made it clear he was thinking about his digital footprint from the beginning. Randy,